as people owning the land and using the land, and it gives more recognition to our rights. Tonight, indigenous nations of the globe share strategies on how to save the planet, even when there's no political will to cooperate. We have to bring the, the nations and the sovereign voices back to the forefront. We speak with a grand chief on why she's running for election as national chief of the Assembly of First Nations. I was looking at the at the package and it said made in Taiwan. To me, that was a, that was a little bit kind of funny, kind of insulting. And it's not just a jingle. Why an Anishinaabe team created her own business. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. The Global Forest Coalition Conference is in full swing this week in Montreal. For four days, over 100 people from across the world will showcase their efforts to preserve forests and press their governments to have better conservation practices. Danielle Rochette reports. They want to celebrate their contribution to biodiversity conservation and their efforts to protecting the world's critical ecosystem. But they also want to highlight the threats they are facing. Simone Lovera, the executive director, comments on the coalition's last report released last week. I think the main findings are on the one hand that uh, community conservation initiatives are extremely viable, uh, not just from a biodiversity conservation perspective, but also very much from a sustainable livelihood perspective. They really are the basis for you know, a more sustainable and economically viable life um, on, in villages on the countryside. Lovera also firmly denounced government's practices when it comes to biodiversity. But also mining infrastructure, uh, a lot of negative projects. And it's just sad that biodiversity, that, that, that governments are actually putting more money into biodiversity destruction still than in biodiversity conservation. For the coalition, the contribution of women, their traditional knowledge and practices into the work of biodiversity should be more recognized. Hindu Umaru Ibram comes from a nomadic community in Chad. Those kind of living in harmony, it's known by the women, but also practiced by women. And those traditional knowledge need to be valued and transferred from one generation to another generation. But value inside the communities because men at the community need also to understand and then people outside of the community need to understand. Adavaya Akao, a well-known campaigner for the rights of indigenous people, shares the progress made in the Pacific Islands. We have a bill that's a traditional knowledge bill. So that would give recognition to the rights of our people in the local community as, um, you know, as people owning the land and using the land. And it gives more recognition to our rights. The coalition also aims to contribute to implementation of the UN Convention of Biological Diversities 2011-2020. Daniel Rochette, EPTN National News, Montreal. Funded by the Canada First Research Excellence Fund, the Sentinel North strategy allows University Laval to conduct research on the North. A project called Project Bright has been created to assess the impact of climate change on the Inuit country food. From July 5th to July 13th, researchers will be on board the Arctic Ocean research vessel Amundsen. Earlier, I spoke with one of the principal investigators, Jean-Éric Tremblay from Quebec City. Mr. Tremblay, thanks for joining us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the objectives of this project? Uh, the BRIGHT project is really aimed at uh, trying to understand better how the changing Arctic environment is influencing the abundance and the quality of marine foods that uh, coastal Inuit communities rely on. And now you're on the second leg of this journey. What were the results from the 2017 activities? The first leg last year was uh, mostly intended at characterizing the physical environment and we've uh, realized that this uh, environment the marine environment between the uh, southern part of Hudson Bay, Hudson Strait and Langava Bay is really different in terms of temperature, in terms of salinity, the amount of fresh water that is supplied by rivers, and also the acidity uh, of the water. So these characteristics of the environment, we believe, will be influencing uh, the quality of the organic matter that the marine plants uh, synthesize in the ecosystem. 
Now the ship will stop in three different communities in Nunavik. What are the kinds of information you'll be looking for there? Uh, we will be sampling really near the coast. Uh, usually when we sample off the Amundsen, we try to stay a little bit offshore. So this time we will be deploying uh, zodiacs uh, and going much closer to shore where the uh, feeding habitat of Arctic char is. So the idea then is to uh, better characterize that feeding habitat and how it differs uh, along the tree coasts. And so what becomes of all this data you're collecting? Uh, the first step really is to collect all the biological samples. Uh, last year we did the, the physical environment, so this year we're going to do the physical environment again. But then we collect a lot of, uh, of tissue samples that we have to analyze. Uh, and these uh, samples will be analyzed for omega trees, for example, antioxidant molecules, uh, metals, uh, things that are both uh, considered to be good uh, for health and the things that may be like contaminants that are less uh, desirable. Uh, so there's a, a long analytical chain ahead of us uh, and we'll spend the next year basically uh, processing all these samples. Mr. Tremblay, exciting stuff. Appreciate you taking some time to join us here today. Thank you, my pleasure. And we would like to hear what you have to say about this or any other story. Here's how to contact us. Send an email to news at aptn.ca, like our APTN National News Facebook page. Follow us on Twitter at APTN News, or go to our website, aptnnews.ca. There seems to be no end in sight for the justice for a stolen children camp at the Saskatchewan Legislature. After several days of talks between camp organizers and provincial cabinet ministers, CTV's Wayne Mantica has the latest. These issues that we talk about are, are when we say that, this, 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 that these systemic issues affect our people, these are representatives of our, of our people. The protesters raised over a dozen issues with the provincial government. It wants an inquiry into the death of Haven Dubois and work toward a second inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous men. They also want to know how many children are in government care, what attempts are being made toward family reunification, a moratorium on adoptions, and a halt of planned foster care expansion. Well, I definitely think that there are ministers that weren't aware of how their portfolio is actually functioning. Um, so I think that uh, being able to point out um, specific issues that we have have personally seen um, can only can only help. The government is willing to pursue future discussion, but doesn't know if it should be with the protesters or with the FSIN. So uh, we've got things that are underway on some of those things already. Uh, and then uh, some of the things, uh, before we go much further on them, we need to have some discussion with our partners at uh, FSIN and uh, the various tribal councils. We need to know where they're at and whether they want us to continue having dialogue with this particular group of people or whether they want to continue the ongoing discussions that we've had with them. Health officials in Quebec say it's the worst heat wave to hit the province in decades. Public health officials confirmed at least 33 people have died from heat-related complications. Now the focus is on trying to prevent any more deaths. We would like to have no death at all, but every day people die, I can tell you that. But because of the uh, temperature, more people are dying, I cannot deny that. But we're working to have less people that... Emergency responders say they've been inundated with calls and the intense heat uh, urging residents to refrain from calling unless it's an absolute emergency. Time for a quick break and then we'll continue our conversations with the candidates for AFN National Chief. Stick around. Here's a look at how Friday's weather forecast is shaping up starting on the east coast. Showers in 25 for Fredericton and Charlottetown. That rain continues into Happy Valley Goose Bay with a high of 20. Rain in Nain and a high of 9. Sun's out in much of Quebec where things are cooling off a bit. 23 in Montreal. Much cooler than it has been in southern Ontario too. 23 in Windsor, Toronto and Peterborough. Warmer in northern Ontario. 27 under the sun in Thunder Bay. A hot day in northern Manitoba, 27 in Churchill and Thompson, 
30 in Dauphin, 29 in Gimli Harbor and Brandon. Warmer still in Saskatchewan, 34 in Swift Current, 33 in Saskatoon, 30 on Friday in Meadow Lake, La Ronge and Buffalo Narrows. Welcome back. The election for AFN National Chief is July 25th in Vancouver. There are five candidates. So far, we've spoken to incumbent Perry Bellegarde, Miles Richardson, and Russ Diabo. Now it's Sheila North's turn. Melissa Ridgen spoke with her earlier. Hi, Ms. North. Thank you so much for joining us. So tell us why you have decided to run for National Chief. I was asked to run for National Chief, actually here in BC by one of the chiefs who was the former interim uh, regional chief for AFN. So she asked me to come and talk to her chiefs about suicides. And so after my, my engagement with them about suicides and my thoughts, they, she pulled me aside and asked me to consider running. So that's ultimately why I'm running. Uh, where do you feel it's in the last four years since the last AFN uh, national chief election, how do you feel um, the, the situation for First Nations people in its relationship with Canada has been? Is it better, worse? What are your thoughts? Well, I think it has improved somewhat since the uh, Harper era. Um, but of course, we have a long way to go yet to, to see the real changes because I think where we're going to see real changes is right on the ground in our urban areas for our Indigenous people, but also, of course, in our communities, isolated and non-isolated communities. If we're not seeing changes and differences there, then all of it is lip service so far by the federal government. And what is it? What do you see AFN's role is in, in taking us to the next to the next step to advance the the circumstances for First Nations people in this country? I think AFN's role is to be a partner to the sovereign nations, not to be the person that approves or disapproves opportunities. And I think we have to bring the, the nations and the sovereign voices back to the forefront and at the national level to make sure that the solutions coming from our communities are better represented and be are heard more clearly and adhered to. Because I think that's what I'm hearing across the country. Actually, I know. I'm hearing across the country that the jurisdiction and the power of our communities come from our people themselves in our communities. So that's where we need to take the voice of a national organization that seeks to represent the voices of our diverse nations. So I see a lot of work um, ahead to transform AFN from what it is. Uh, it's not a government. It's not a level of government. If the, if the nations and the chiefs and the councillors want it to be that way, then it's up to them and they'll have to design it. But right now, it's not. It, it need, the AFN, as it is, needs to transform itself. There's uh, critics who say that the AFN is no longer relevant and doesn't represent grassroots people at all. Uh, what would you do to improve that image of AFN? Well, that's exactly what I'm talking about. We have to take the grassroots voices and, and opinions and, of course, the chiefs uh, to the forefront more. We have to go, go to the places where we need to hear them and find a way, a process that brings the, those voices out more to the forefront and clearer because we have to be accountable to our communities and our families, ultimately, our women and our children. If they're not safe, then none of us should be happy. None of us should feel that we were secure if our women and children are not safe and that's where we have to take it to that level of thinking and I, that we have a lot of work to do to do that and we have a lot of um, experts and our own technicians that are able to guide us in that process to be able to go and, and make sure that our grassroots are represented and feel that they are part of a national conversation rather than being left out and seeing decisions made at higher levels without their input. So is this a, a, a restructuring of AFN? Is it a, just a thinking from a different perspective? I mean, how do you see the actual, the nuts and bolts of what you're talking about? How do you make that happen? It seems like it's not an easy task to get, uh, to, to shift from uh, dealing with government to getting involved with the grassroots people in the communities. So how do you even tackle something that big? 
Well, I think that's where the natural evolution is happening for this organization. It might have had a different feel and different mandate when it was first established, but now we're at a point now that we're, our sovereign nations are, are taking back their jurisdiction and taking back the authority and autonomy of their own nations, and th that has to be respected. That has to be, uh, you know, brought more to the forefront to be able to guide the work of a national chief and the regional chiefs. I think we're being a disservice to the communities if we're not adhering to the solutions coming from the communities and and the solutions are going to be different and that's what we have to do as a national chief and as regional chiefs to 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 look at the different regions in our respective you know territories to make sure that each region has in some way a process that allows their voices to be heard um, and you know I, I'm saying it maybe oversimplifying it right now but I think there is a way we can do that that we have enough people now that are educated in our communities who can help us with that uh, be it lawyers and policy analysts and, and people that understand politics but also understand and respect our indigenous laws all of that has to be uh, can, uh, brought to to the to the levels now that need, that have ne we've never seen before because we're dealing with new situations that we've not dealt with 30 years ago perhaps and some of course the same old situations that we've dealt with but now we have to be able to transform as an organization as the AFN body but also as a nation and how we interact with each other to make sure that Canada understands who we are where we are and why we love this land and our people so much. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and share your views on the direction of AFN from here on out. Thank you. A 17-year-old entrepreneur is being affected by the trade war going on between the United States and Canada. We'll have that story and more coming up after the break. Here's a look at the rest of Friday's weather forecast, picking back up in northern Alberta. Sunny skies and 30 above in Fort Chippewan and Fort McMurray. Intense heat for Medicine Hat with a high of 36, 32 in Red Deer. Another warm day for the BC interior, 29 under the sun in Penticton, 30 in Kamloops. 23 in Fort St. John, 25 in Fort Nelson. Cloudy day across the Yukon, a high of 20 for Mayo in Beaver Creek. Rain in parts of NWT. 20 in Trout Lake, 18 in Fort Simpson, plus 3 in Saks Harbor, plus 4 in Politic, 9 in Colville Lake. In Nunavut, 26 in Arviette, rain and a high of 9 in Repulse Bay, 10 above on Friday in Cape Dorset and Aglulik, plus 2 in Resolute. Welcome back. Starting a business takes passion, patience, and perseverance. A Manitoba teen who manufactures a piece of traditional dancewear shows just that after the unexpected trade war between Canada and the United States. Ashley Branson brings us more. Emily McKinney isn't your average 17-year-old. The recent high school graduate manufactures her own jingle cones. It started more than a year ago. She wanted to make her own jingle dress. After buying jingles from a supply store, she discovered something. I was looking at the, at the package and it said made in Taiwan. To me, that was, that was a little bit kind of funny, kind of insulting considering that the jingle dress cones um, represents, you know, um, it's, it's a, it has a sacred meaning as it represents healing. Within a day, McKinney already created a business name. It's Anishinaabe Bimishimo which means the people that dance in the Anishinaabe language. And designed her own logo with a sacred meaning behind it. We have a teepee that represents home, as it's made, you know, in my hometown, uh, close to my home community. We have a door right here, which um, represents that we're always open to, you know, ideas, suggestions, anything like that. We're always open. Her business went public December 2017. The sales pretty much just skyrocketed. And like it was it was crazy. Not only is she selling her product locally, but also internationally. We've had sales from BC all the way to Nova Scotia, all the way down to San Diego. And on top of that, we have people from France and the UK that are selling our uh, that are buying our cones. She says she'd love to know the reason why people are buying her jingles 
and she hopes they're making jingle dresses and spreading the meaning and the style of dance. Emily's mom has supported her from day one. I'm really proud of everything that she's accomplished and uh, making all these connections. Like, you know, she's got a lot of people out there supporting her and it's nice to see. Starting a new business comes setbacks, money being one of them. And a lot of the requirements, you know, you need a credit score, you need to be 18 years old, you need to be, you know, all these things. And I'm not even old enough to have a credit card. <laughs> With the help from a few so financial organizations, Emily is able to keep machine. moving forward. Now with Canada's exemption from steel and aluminum tariffs, it's put a foil in Emily's plans. With the tariffs, you know, on steel and stuff, uh, we have to pay 50% more of um, what we usually pay for our metal. Now they're looking for more financial assistance. We're trying to look, see if there's any, like, investor or any banks or any kind of, just anything that would be able to, to give us just a small push to be able to afford the metal. Despite the hurdles, Emily remains optimistic. We still have our heads up high and we hope to, you know, continue um, being strong and to overcome, you know, even more obstacles. Ashley Branson, APTN National News, Somerset. Good work, Emily. Good luck moving forward. Looking to switch up your cardio routine? A oh, Winnipeg hoop dancer is using her skills to bring women together. And as CTV's Michelle Gerwing reports, she's helping people get fit through traditional Indigenous dance and teachings. Oh, feel your whole body stretch out. Like many fitness classes, this one begins with a good warm-up and stretch. But here, the real workout starts with the beat of traditional drums. So our dance is originated with staying very close to the ground. This is powwow fit. Like a Zumba, but a fusion of traditional Indigenous culture and music. It was started by Shanley Spence, an international Indigenous hoop and fancy shawl dancer. Just acknowledging, feeling our bodies get grounded. She uses steps from traditional Indigenous dances. And this is a jingle dress song, so it's a little fast. Fused with cultural teachings to empower those who attend. They definitely get a physical workout with their bodies, their muscles, but it's also, they get empowering messages along the way, so it's also really good for their minds and their spirits as women. Spence says she decided to do this to answer a call from the community to get more women together. Don't be afraid of your hips. Be proud of our bodies. Adding her inspiration came from other women doing similar classes in the U.S. There was one woman who was doing a powwow fit in her yoga classes, and there's also YouTube videos of a young woman who does powwow sweat. The hour-long class isn't easy. Awesome. Powwow dancing takes a lot of stamina, a lot of endurance. These ladies came to try something new and say they're leaving with a new appreciation for powwow dance. It was just so much fun. It went by so quickly, and I feel like really tired in the best possible way. Yeah, I just learned about the different dances and the roots of those dances and how much meaning there and significance there is in each of those. Spence says to her, powwow fit is more than a workout. She's helping some women reconnect with their culture through movement. So many women from so many different backgrounds, ages, different lives um, just come together and inspire each other, motivate each other and have fun. Michelle Gerwing, CTV News, Winnipeg. Great story. That's your APTN National News for this Thursday. You can find more news anytime on our website, aptnnews.ca. Dennis Ward, have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.